The following is a Michigan sesquicentennial year presentation. There's hardly a more beautiful setting for a fisherman than a trout stream. This is the Manistee River. Beautiful country up here in northern Michigan. I love being out on a stream like this. I love fishing trout. I love eating trout. You like eating too, don't you, Charlie? I like eating trout as well. <laughs> Charlie Weaver is my guide today. We're going to be in this Osable River boat on the Manistee. There's one little hitch in this, though, that normally I don't do on Michigan Outdoors. One thing, this is a flies only stretch. Right. That's OK. I like to use bait when I fish. I really enjoy it. Another thing, this has the slotted limits, and it's in the the no-kill country, where there's a big controversy up here right now whether people should keep the fish or throw them all back. You know my opinion. I've always been a lifelong catch and fillet, bring them home and eat them. But I can't do that today. Charlie makes his living guiding, and for catching big trout, you say, we got to throw the big ones back, right? I say that, and I say some smaller ones too as well. And I would say that on rivers like the Manistee and the Asabo that are, that are heavily fished by, by a lot of anglers, uh, people ought to consider putting back all their trout. Now, I'm not, I'm not an expert fly fisherman. I'm not, you know, of this breed that uh, wears all the Orvis and, uh, you know, Eddie Bauer stuff. And, and you know what I mean? I know. There's an image of trout fishermen of the flies only and the no kill that's a pretty exclusive. I'm really not cut from that cloth. My question to you is, should I be comfortable on this trip? I don't think you're going to be able to answer that till after you've come off the trip. I think we're going to have a good time. <laughs> I, yeah, I think we're going to catch some fish. And I think some of those fish we're going to catch are fish that, that other fishermen have put back. But what about me and my attitudes? And, you know, like I said, I am not the elitist fly fisherman. Do uh, I belong here? Yeah, you belong here. I'd like to think that everybody belongs in, 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 in a river. Um, I'm saying that, that, that you have to cons consider as many factors as you can and uh, make, make your own decision on, on, on what you're going to do with the fish, the fish you catch. Um, I strongly uh, encourage Throwing them back. catch and release. Throwing them back, gently. Okay. Even. It's uh, going to be a learning experience for me. Okay. And a little uh, conditioning. What are we going to catch? Are we going to catch any big ones? We might. We might. We got a we got a cloudy day. It's fairly early in the morning still. Um, we might we might get into some big ones. You're right in the middle of the hexagenia hatch, uh, and that's prime time up here, mostly at night though. Mm -hmm. We're gonna give it a shot in the daytime. Well, it lets our folks out there see what the river is like. That's right. You can't see the river too much at night. <laughs> I think you're gonna you're gonna see why fishing a trout stream is most of the joy, just being here, right? Right. Charlie Weaver, Fred Trost, Michigan Outdoors. It's Thursday night. Come on along. We're going to have a good time. From the rugged shore and woodlands of the north, it's history of copper mines and iron ore, the Great Lakes fisheries. To the farmlands of the southern counties, we'll look around again at all that waits the sportsmen in the state of Michigan. You're talking catch and release, something that is not my normal uh, normal mode of operation, because I like to catch them and eat them. Now, I got to know two things. I, I know you, you're very particular about not handling the fish, releasing them gently, and so on. Does this mean like you can't touch the fish, or else you're going to be irritated, because that's, and I'll get letters, people say, you shouldn't touch the fish like that, you were too rough on them. <laughs> what exactly is the point to where you know you have had the biggest thrill in this experience of catch and release. You said, I can't eat it, I can't clean it, I can't, you know, hold it up and take a picture of it, I can't put it on a stringer, um, I can't touch it. Where is it that I'm going to have all the fun? Okay. The battle? What about up at the boat? I can't pick it up and say, hey, Charlie, look at how big it is. Can we measure it? Mm -hmm. What are you going to put me through here? How much are you going to take away? Okay. How much money does the average person spend catching a fish, the fish they're going to eat? Quite a bunch. If, if all they were into is eating fish, mm -hmm. they would go to the store, and they could okay. get a lot more pounds of fish for their money. Agreed. They don't. Why don't they? 
they like fishing. Uh -huh. They like fishing. There's something about being out there fishing they like. So it's not just eating the fish. Okay. Okay. I'll, I'll give that up. Okay. But now, how close can I get to the fish? What is it that, that the catch and releasers, you're sort of representing the catch and release, where is it that you're going to slap my hand and say, you've had enough, it goes back? No, I'm not going to slap your hand. Because... Well, you know, I get... I know, because... You know the attitude between yeah. catch and releasers and those yeah. who don't. It, yeah. Um... Can you, can you diddle around with the fish a little bit on the hook and, and look at it I and think, enjoy it? You know, I think one of the prettiest things out there in that river is a brook trout. Mm -hmm. And, and if, I, if, if all the browns and the rainbows and grayling were gone, they were just brook trout, that would be fine with me. You know, if the brook trout don't get as big as, as the large browns. Cause, and I would, I would hope you'd take a, a, a decent brook trout and pick them up in your hands and admire that fish. And that's okay? I, it's perfectly okay. Wet my hands first. Because because I tell you, hold them gently. Beautiful. Don't just dang them up there like mm -hmm. he's on the rope flopping because a fish needs its weight. I'm saying treat the fish with care. Same care you treat, treat any of your natural resources with. What do you do when you get a big fish that you've been fishing for, you finally caught it, it's there, you've done it, and it's beautiful. How long do you look at it? Do you just take it up and shake it off, or what? I, first of all, I, I usually have them in a the net. Oh, you do? Oh, yeah, yeah, because you can bring a fish to a net a lot more quickly than you can to hand, mm -hmm. especially a large fish. And the less time you're playing him, he's going to be in better shape for a, for a good release. I then like to release my fish in shallow water. That's usually over on the side of the stream. Now why? So that they are swimming against less current mm -hmm. when they're starting back off. You can hold them easier. Often you have to resuscitate a, a large fish. It would be more fun to watch them too in shallow water, wouldn't it? Yeah, yeah. Plus, with a good fish, you do have a bit of time. You do have a bit of time, you might take them over, put them on the bank beside your rod, take a picture. You can do that, huh? I've got a good camera there, yeah. You lay them down on the bank, they're still gonna live when you put them back. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, with care, with care. Well, maybe I can enjoy this thing. I hope so. <laughs> but you know, it does sound like it wouldn't be much fun if you have to bring them right up and then flick them right off. You know, yeah. looking at that fish, they are so yeah. beautiful. It's like looking at the river. If, yeah. if, if you made me come out here with blinders on, you know, sure, I could hear the birds, and that's great, but I want to look at them, too. Yeah. I want to show them to these folks. They want to see the fish. Yes, we should show them a few, shouldn't we? Okay. We showed you some of the trout we caught, and back they went. How'd I like catch and release? Well, research isn't conclusive that no kill is all that much better for trout fishing, but a lot of fly fishermen believe it is. I had such a good time with Charlie Weaver, talking about the outdoors, chatting about life, and enjoying the trout stream, learning a lot about fly fishing for trout, that I didn't miss taking trout home for dinner. Catch and Release puts a little more emphasis on good company outdoors. I had it, it made my day. A good day of trout fishing in Michigan outdoors. Charlie Weaver's stomping grounds are right here at Grayling. The Osabo flows east, Manistee flows west. That's where we were fishing. He'll be there all summer long. Now, the trout fishing is a lot better since we've gotten some rain throughout the North Country, especially in the UP, according to Root Cellar. See if you can't get out on what should be a good weekend and qualify for the trophy book. 22 pounds, 4 ounces. That muskie is 46 inches long, caught by Michael Collins from Pontiac. Trolling Lake St. Clair with a believer, that's what you can catch in July. A gravel pit in Macomb County was a honey hole for Bob Bunner from Rochester Hills. He was casting a jitterbug at 11 o'clock at night a little over a month ago. That largemouth bass is nearly two feet long. It weighed in at a whopping seven pounds, 13 ounces. Ray Harrington from Terre Haute, Indiana came over to Michigan waters a few weeks ago trolled a daredevil at two in the afternoon and hooked into this 18 pound, 38 inch steelhead trout, an easy master angler winner. Mike Shea from Traverse City was still fishing a minnow in East Bay, latched onto this hefty 16 pound, 30 inch Great Lakes brown trout. That's a heavy bodied fish, <laughs> but for big bellies, this bluegill takes a prize. I've never seen one full of spawn like this. But Joe Hughes from Muskegon caught it on a worm from Fremont Lake. It weighed in at a pound and a half. Long and lean is how you describe this Great Lakes muskie. Tiger fan Curtis Kratt is the lucky angler. Curtis got a 25 pounder even, 49 inches long on a flatfish Lake St. Clair. Uh, we trolled for about three hours and 
about 10 o'clock in the morning and hit and made about two runs and uh, ran back towards the boat and I thought it was off and I told my uncle, he's off, he shook it and he didn't, he said, you feel the lure? I said, no, and he said, it's still on, keep reeling. And about 20 minutes later, I had him in. Great. 25 pounder, 49 inches long on a flatfish, Lake St. Clair. Congratulations on that one. That goes to Curtis Kratt from Roseville. A great trophy, a great picture, a great baseball cap. Curtis Kratt, our Michigan Outdoors Trophy Angler of the Week. You know, every year at the Outdoor Fair, one of the main attractions is the Muzzleloader's Village. It's a place where people can come from miles around to get a sense of what it was like in the pioneer days. The biggest muzzleloading event in the nation takes place every year in Friendship, Indiana. And like the Outdoor Fair, it's family camps like this one that highlight the rendezvous. The frontier camps are authentic in most every detail and are a colorful part of muzzleloading. Now, shooting, of course, well, that's the big draw, but just as important is the chance to get together with other muzzleloaders and test their skills against each other using essentially the same firearms that were used by early settlers. Competition is tough, and winning isn't easy. It's very hard competition. This is the best competition in the country. At shorter ranges, flintlock rifles can be just as accurate as their modern counterparts, and some are one-of-a-kind examples of the gunmaker's art, authentic in every detail to those made by early American gunsmiths. Who enjoys muzzleloading? Actually, just about everyone. We have mountain people down here, we have doctors, we have dentists, we have uh, engineers, we have lawyers, we have school teachers, uh, we have home builders, we have them from every walk of life. And nowadays, it's a sport that's attracting more and more women. Uh, I enjoy the shooting. Not very good at it, but I do enjoy it. Yes, it's part serious competition, part fun, a lot of history. And whether you see the muzzleloading village at the outdoor fair or the national muzzleloading championships, you can be sure you'll be seeing an important part of the heritage of Michigan outdoors. The July-August issue of the Digest is out in the mail tomorrow to our Outdoors Club members. More information on that later on in the show. But we have all of our mailbag questions and answers. This one we have, Bob, is on round balls for muzzle loading and what's called the maxi ball. Steve Frey and Stephen Davis from Otter Lake says, we are muzzle loading hunters. We'd like to know why it's illegal to use the maxi ball to hunt big game in Michigan. We can somewhat understand that using a high powered good trajectory load in zone three, southern Michigan, where it might be considered dangerous. But why can't we use a maxi ball in zones one and two, northern Michigan during regular rifle deer season? Well, as I understand the law, dur during the regular rifle deer season, you can use the maxi ball, except in su southern. the southern zone, the, right. the zone three, uh, where you must use a round, the ball. round ball. And during the muzzle loading season in December, you have to use the round ball in all Statewide. zones. Statewide. So it statewide. can be used. The, uh, this is a more modern innovation in muzzleloading hunting, and the muzzleloaders themselves, when they got their season passed, wanted to keep the mu muzzleloading season primitive. So that's why the round ball is in the muzzleloading season statewide. And uh, it's been attempted to be changed several times, and it's met with uh, some opposition from muzzleloading groups. Because they want to keep it primitive. Right. So you can use it during regular rifle season. And now let's see if you folks can answer this question in the outdoor quiz. What year did the Michigan legislature first set a limited season on hunting white-tailed deer? Year-round hunting for white-tailed deer ended in Michigan in 1859 when the legislature instituted a season starting on August 1st and ending on December 31st. Market hunting was still legal, however. These spokes are part of what was a, the standard wheelchair 10 years ago. 98% of the wheelchairs sold in this country were like this. Handles on the back so somebody can push you around. Roger, this is what people think of when they think of being confined to a wheelchair. And your chair, the one that you use all the time, doesn't even have, there's no way somebody can help push you around. No, we have uh, the new modern lightweight uh, airplane and aluminum wheelchairs now that make it a lot easier for folks to get around compared to these these old chairs. But you know, you have an artificial leg and one reattached so you can walk. Right. So you can get up and move around and people see you sometimes moving around and they say, well, why in the world would he use a wheelchair if he can walk? Why? Well, I thought of that when I first got into using the chair. When I first got hurt, I didn't use it. 
I would try to get out and go through stores or my daily life uh, walking with my canes. And I found out, you know, I could jump in that chair and I could get eight more hours in the day rather than being, you know, using just uh, trying to walk and get tired out. So these things are just like you wearing your glasses. You take mm -hmm. them off, you can't see, or people with hearing aids, you know, mm -hmm. so you can hear the music. You know, it's a funny thing. I didn't wear glasses uh, regularly until I was about 20 years old because I didn't like the way it looked. I found out, though, if I used them, I could see. Yeah. I can see outdoors. I'm better hunting, fishing. Yeah. Uh, so these have turned into a tool. Sure. So, so many times there would be things that, you know, maybe my kids were playing ball or going somewhere. I wouldn't go because, you know, no place to sit. Now I, I go in, I get my own seat. So a wheelchair, as we found out in, in Outdoors Forever, is a tool. In fact, we're encouraging people. You encourage people to use a wheelchair, don't you, who wheelchair, have trouble walking? Right. If we can get one person to use a wheelchair or a hearing aid or adaptions that get some more out in the outdoors and doing more in life, then that's what we're here for. If you can think of a, a wheelchair, like a lightweight fishing rod or glasses. Or even a car. People don't walk sure. anymore. They jump in a car. That's a tool. If you folks have any ideas or you've come across people who have come up with different adaptions, whether it's a wheelchair or any type of adaption that makes it easier to get around outdoors, especially in hunting and fishing, write to us. Let us know. We'll put it in the new expanded version of the Outdoors Forever magazine, which will be coming out in September, October. That's what we want to hear, right, Raj? That's what I want to hear and so see. You're not confined to this. No. This is my friend. Friend. Something you use to get around. Interesting thing we've learned and outdoors forever. Now let's take a look at some of the events coming up in our outdoor calendar. It's a different recipe for fish. This is something like we fished with rabbit before or pheasant. Mm. Yeah, that's broccoli with uh, walleye. Right, different, very different. Hmm. Most of the time we see those combinations, it's in a soup or a stew, you know, but not in a casserole. Well, Bob Garner is the first one. Hey, there's a little tang to this, is there? <laughs> yeah, I'll tell you, is, I know. This is pretty neat. This is pretty neat. I know what the tang is from. It's from this cream sauce that's on the top. And the lemon juice, remember? In yes. fact, this has an incredible number of ingredients. When yeah. you look at the recipe, it's, a, uh, of course, the... Sour cream. Sour cream and Miracle Whip. Right. Minced onion. You could use fresh onion, but this is going to cook quite some time, and it cooked down quite a bit. Lemon, pepper, and garlic salt. Now, it called for a lemon, pepper, garlic seasoning. So we just combined them. And if you use garlic salt, then you won't want to use regular salt. That's right. Salt, That's right. Because it is salty. White pepper and black pepper. It calls for both of those. I That's wonder right. why. White pepper is not going to give it quite as much color. The little black specks won't, you won't see quite as many of them. And it is a little bit stronger. And then there's parsley, chopped parsley, about I a use tablespoon. Fresh. And celery flakes. You could use fresh. I did, yes. Yep. Mix all those together in the right proportions, about a tablespoon or two of each. Right. There's, there's the tang right there. Yeah, the lemon juice, yep. And when we were taping this, O.J. said that it would make a good dip. It did. Oh, I thought oh, it was great. Oh, I think it's a little overpowering for a dip. <laughs> but uh, They're good for fresh vegetables. Maybe not chips, but fresh vegetables. Now, this has got cut broccoli and just little pieces of it. You could use fresh. Another oh, month or so, you could use fresh broccoli. Go drizzle melted butter over the top of that. And it called for sprinkles of lemon juice. Now, that's a bit difficult. Try sprinkling from a yeah. bottle like this. <laughs> this was just a little <laughs> bit more than a sprinkle there. So. And the wale. There it is. That, that is Muskegon Lake wale, Bob, we've had in the freezer. Look at the size of those fillets. Mm. Nice, okay. nice They're big white walleyes. Meat. Oh, yes, it, yeah, right. Could just lay this on top of your broccoli. And this is what we've often done with, with rabbit, pheasant, this, That's right. this type of idea. Right, same concept. And here comes the sauce. Spread this all over the top. I think Bob's about ready for another piece there. <laughs> <laughs> he's watching with, with one eye. Going to add a little bit of lemon juice to the butter and then pour that over the top. And then the last thing you put on is some breadcrumbs. Just give it just a tiny bit of crunch on top. That lemon butter flavor oh, yeah. I really like. Yep, you can't beat it. Bob is ready for a second helping, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> Yes, you know, sir. and this dishes out nicely. I mean, it, it, it stays together. What? It doesn't Why are you being so scotch with the, uh, well, <laughs> we got to have something here for the people to look at. That's right. After all. You know, when we cooked this, you, everybody kept coming in and saying, all the way down the hall, mm -hmm. it smells so good. So what do you think, Bob? Give us your analysis. Well, my mother used to f cook fish with white sauce. Mm -hmm. This is really good. <laughs> <laughs> Well, hers was never this, this tangy or whatever. This it's is a tasty, tangy white sauce. And you can see spices. here the, the fish is just on top of the broccoli. 
and the breading on top, the uh, bread crumbs, is, is, is kind of crusty. But there it is, that white meat. Has it cooked for how long in the oven? An hour. An hour. Four, Plus, forty-five minutes covered and then 15 uncovered. Fred, the other thing about this recipe, too, with the broccoli in it, the vegetable in it, and even though it's got all this creamy stuff on it, it is incredibly light mm -hmm. tasting. It, it is. is not a heavy, rich recipe. And right. this came from Sue Philport from Southgate, who contributed this to our contest. Right. And, Bob, where can people get a copy of Sue's recipe? So. <laughs> but, you know, it does sound like it wouldn't be much fun if you have to bring them right up and then flick them right off. You know? Yeah. Looking at that fish, they are so yeah. beautiful. It's like looking at the river. If, yeah. if, if you made me come out here with blinders on, you know, sure, I could hear the birds, and that's great, but I want to look at them, too. Yeah. I want to show them to these folks. They want to see the fish. Yes, we should show them a few, shouldn't we? Okay. We showed you some of the trout we caught, and back they went. How'd I like catch and release? Well, research isn't conclusive that no kill is all that much better for trout fishing, but a lot of fly fishermen believe it is. I had such a good time with Charlie Weaver, talking about the outdoors, chatting about life, and enjoying the trout stream, learning a lot about fly fishing for trout, that I didn't miss taking trout home for dinner. Catch and release puts a little more emphasis on good company outdoors. I had it, it made my day. A good day of trout fishing in Michigan outdoors.